Hello, my name is Randall Bills. Hard as it is to believe some days, though the gray does do a credible job at trying to convince me. Come this December, 34 years ago, a pimply-faced 15-year-old me biked with his friends, Tony and Chad, to Desert Hobbies in Tempe, Arizona, to buy the Battletech 2nd Edition box set. In fact, this exact box set, right here. I fell in love the moment I opened the lid. And as you can see behind me, it's become a lifelong passion, as I still enjoy the fiction and playing the game. Since that time, I've been involved in the writing, development, and publication of Battletech for the last 25 years. First at FASA Corporation, back at the start of 1996, then through WizKids and FanPro, and now with Catalyst Game Labs. I've also had opportunities to be involved in elements of various electronic creations as well. Most recently, as the lore advisor for Hairbrain Schemes Battletech game and co-story development for Piranha Games MechWarrior Mercenaries. I'm always humbled and grateful that along that road, I've worked and become friends with such Battletech luminaries as Jordan Wiseman and Michael Stackpole, Ross Babcock, Blaine Pardo, Lauren Coleman, Mitch Gittleman, Russ Bullock, Nick Smith, and dozens and dozens of others. Of all the electronic games I've tackled, however, I'm not sure there's anything that can approach the sheer immersion of the virtual world entertainment Battletech centers on their pods. Back in 1995, Tara and I were visiting my sister in Concord, California, and I remember slipping down to the Walnut Creek Center to visit. Yeah, I uh, <laughs> spent way too much money and time that afternoon. All these years later, when I get a chance at a convention I'm working, there's still an immersion like no other as I climb inside the cockpit, shut out the world, and grab the joysticks as the HUD goes live. And yet, that story and the people that made it a reality goes well beyond the Battletech we know and love. They forged a legacy that has gone on to impact so many aspects of electronic gaming, including inventing many of the ubiquitous elements of such experiences, like gamer tags. For the first time in over two decades, the primary individuals involved have gathered via video to share this untold story of bringing the Battletech centers to life. Having been directly involved in so many aspects of Battletech for so long, its history is practically written in my DNA. And yet even I learned nuances about this story that enriched my passion for the Battletech universe. So don your coolant vest, grab your neuro helmet, and strap in for an exploration of a history that deserves to be heard. No guts. No galaxy. To start this conversation off about where the idea for the Battletech Center and cockpits began, I want to take us way back in time. And I'm going to go way, way, way back in time to 1980 in the Marine Merchant Academy in New York, where Ross, uh, Ross Babcock and Jordan Weissman were introduced to the Academy's Full Bridge Simulator. And according to a lot of the press reports, that's where some of these ideas for this interactive virtual reality uh, adventure began. You guys remember what that was like being on the Full Bridge Simulator in uh, MMA? 
Um, yeah, no, I mean, I remember, uh, so I was a freshman uh, and um, we got a tour it. I don't know if you ever got to know any more of it. Well, we, get, we got to do like, basically a walkthrough and see it run. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it was a recreation of a, of a ship's bridge uh, with all the actual, you know, user interfaces, all the actual uh, equipment. And then it had big projection screens in incredibly low poly um, you know, version of a, of a ship navigating, um, you know, an entrance to a port. Uh, and I uh, just came out of that thinking, well, that's the future of entertainment. And I can't believe they spent 50 million on that. We could do it much cheaper. <laughs> um, uh, and so, yeah, that was, I, for me, it was like, okay, yeah, I know what the future is now. Uh, you know, how do we go build it? Ross, what did you think? Um, I think I was, we were only allowed to go on it once. And, uh, you know, they had New York Harbor simulated and they were their favorite thing to do was to run uh, the oil tanker collision, which caught on fire in New York Harbor. And uh, the thing about the KR simulator was that it's a ship and ship in New York Harbor is going to travel at about 10, 12 knots, 10, 15 miles an hour. Um, so it's not very exciting. It's cool. And it is a real ship's bridge, but it's a little on the slow side. And, uh, you know, I was a senior when Jordan was a freshman. I, you know, volunteered my room as a place to store his Apple computer. Um, <laughs> since he didn't have privileges to do so. And, uh, you know, somewhere in a folder in one of my file boxes are all of our original notes on this team play interactive computer game that uh, we had dreams of building with uh, quote unquote off the shelf hardware and software. And I can tell you where my Apple II ended up because we tried building it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's where I was gonna go next is because in, in there, there's a lot of interesting stories and documentation and some, some myth making that's been going on about the beginnings of this, of, you know, of these adventures. So in like 1982, there's the discussion that you guys started to try to network a bunch of Apple IIs together. What? what? Well, yeah, well, we, actually, we should correct the dates because we started FASA in 1980, mm -hmm. right? So yep. our experience on the bridge was in 78 or 79. Okay. Um, I don't remember which. Uh, I'm guessing probably 78. Uh, right? so you were you were and you were the you entered in 79. I graduated in 1980, so 79 or fall or spring of 1980 is when we would have been there. Okay. Hmm. So this this next step with the apples. What was the next step with the apples in that first that first network game that was being you know put together then? Well, uh, so we got back to Chicago, um, and uh, there was no such thing as a network. Um, and but the the premise was that we could, should be able to recreate what they had done with this big $50 million mainframe we could do with a bunch of, of um, connected, you know, microcomputers uh, or Apple IIs. Um, there was, I can't remember the name, it was Budge something. It was a, it was a early polygonal rendering uh, software out for the Apple II. And so we were playing with that and we were trying to figure out how to um, get the you know two apples to talk to each other so we could get two screens rendering in connection with each other and the only way to do it was to serially connect the hard you know serially connect the motherboards which will work but if you just are a little bit off you fry the motherboard and that's what happened to mine <laughs> i had apple i had like apple two 500 and something uh, uh off the assembly line and uh uh yeah we fried it <laughs> Um, but that, that initial idea though, Jordan, for, for linking those two, those two apples was that, uh, what type of, what type of SIM or what type of experience were you guys starting to play with? Well, like, like, um, Ross said, what we, we were, um, very much in the bridge concept, right? We were like, okay, well, instead of a, instead of a slow moving freighter, uh, through New York Harbor, let's turn it into a starship bridge and let's think about all the different roles you could do on a starship, very much patterned on Star Trek. Um, and, uh, and so that's what we were trying to do. It was kind of like, okay, we have a navigator's uh, screen. We have a engineering screen. We have a gunner's screen. We have the front viewport. Those were what we were trying to create completely unsuccessfully, but that's what, that's what the goal. What did you think of when you saw, when Artemis started to be released for, uh, <laughs> for tablets and PCs a couple of years ago? 
Oh, our, our, I've played Artemis a bunch. It's, and it is, it's exactly what we were thinking about all those years ago. And actually our first version, the first version we went out to try to sell. So before, before Fassel was founded, right, we put together this concept um, for doing a, these, this entertainment, these, you know, virtual reality entertainment centers. They weren't called virtual reality. We called it ESP, Environmental Simulations Project was the name of the the project and the first company. Um, and so we did um, a little business plan and some sketches. Um, and we, it was very much a Star Trek kind of related concept. And we went out and tried to present it to some uh, VCs that uh, Mort had hooked us up with. Um, and uh, we sat down and said, all right, so, and we just did the whole pitch. And there were <laughs> those complete blank faces there. We're like, I remember they had three, they only had three problems with the business plan. It was like, what the hell is a computer game? Why would people buy a ticket to play it? And who, you're a college dropout. Who the fuck are you? You know? <laughs> um, so there was only three problems uh, with it. Uh, and needless to say, we didn't get anywhere. Um, but yeah, but it was working on that that then kind of inspired us to start FASA. It was like, well, all right, we're not going to get raised money to build this thing. So let's start, you know, let's uh, try to go to the role-playing game market and, you know, we'll get rich overnight and then we'll, we'll pay that off. That'll pay for uh, building the thing we really want to build. So that, that was our sophisticated business plan. Mm -hmm. So now, now Jordan for you know, years now, you've gone through multiple pitches on multiple different companies and you've seen, you know, so many different aspects of that as it, the, the, a networked game in the 80s, which is, again, it's beyond what anybody is thinking about, you know, uh, of what entertainment could be like, as the idea starts to develop for the Battletech Center, and as ESP develops, how did that work with, again, getting those pitches out to uh, venture capitalists? How, how steep of a fight was that to try to get money? We didn't have any venture capitalists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what happened was that uh, Ross and Jordan created uh, a whole series of early games that were reasonably successful. And then Mech Warrior Battletech showed up and it was it, very quickly a very good success. I had joined them in, uh, in uh, 03 and it looked like we had a someplace between a quarter of a million and $300,000 that we could used to develop this this uh, simulator that Jordan and Ross were pushing so hard on me. And I, and I said to myself, well, I know my son well enough to know it's going to cost more than $300,000. <laughs> because nothing that Jordan has ever done has cost what he thought it was going to cost. But uh, we committed fast as total... It was only 10 times off, Dad. I mean, it wasn't <laughs> that bad. We, we, A single the three, of us, the three of us who were partners committed the company to do this thing. And, uh, and we did find people with capital, but they weren't venture capitalists. They, okay. they were uh, people who were interested in doing something similar uh, themselves. In, in the mid-80s, as this idea is coming together, in Chicago, you have some, you know, truly amazing companies to be working around in the Chicago environment at that time. You know, you have the arcade companies of Bali Midway, Williams, Stern, Gottlieb, and Incredible Technologies. How did the, uh, how did the idea come around to lock into which developers and who could support this idea to really, you know, bring it to reality? How did, how did you guys end up with Incredible Technologies? So, um, yeah, after, so after, as, as Mart said, after we kind of, had uh, raised enough what we thought was enough capital. We um, went out and networked our way to three development teams um, to uh, to discuss this and kind of get quotes and kind of figure out what we would do with it. Uh, so one was Incredible Technologies, um, and I can't remember how we met them initially. I can't remember how we met any of them, but but it was Incredible Technologies. The second one was actually. Um, uh, I remember the guy's Mark. He became it became. Um, oh, Mark Cantor. Uh, Mark Cantor. That's right. Yeah. And what was like? It was like uh, director that became Flash. Remember that was. Yep. He, he had built uh, his team had built Director, and uh, and so we spent much time with him looking at 
at, at building, and I can't remember who the third firm was, um, but really Incredible Technologies was the only ones who had the kind of breadth of, of technology experience in both hardware and software. Um, and, uh, and they were much more kind of like, they had, they had faced a, a bunch of diverse challenges, whereas the other guys were very much more narrow in terms of the tech they had built. Well, they're, they're more like us. Yes. That's that's a good description. They yeah. they would shoot from the hip people. <laughs> so as, as as the prototype starts to come together with incredible technologies, um, you know the original idea, like you said, was you know how much of this could be off the shelf versus custom hardware. And as we move down the line with the development of cockpits, we get into more and more custom hardware. For the prototypes and system one, how much of that really was custom and how much was off the shelf? So um, we started from the premise that we were going to do it with like what was the hottest you know, home computer, which was an Amiga at the time. And uh, that proved to be quickly wrong. Um, and, uh, and I think it was incredible technologies that brought in um, Mar uh, Marcus? Adam. Adam. Adam, Adam yeah. I, I, there's a newer, more recent guy that fills that spot in my life, I guess. I was jumping his name. But, but Adam, Adam was an incredible guy. Um, <laughs> they, they brought him in originally as, uh, as a hardware engineer. And uh, was it him or somebody who had identified this um, new chip from TRW that was designed for doing uh, titles on football games and things? So it was, it would, you know, it could scale and rotate, bit, bit, you know, uh, basically 2D images. images. Yeah. Um, and so he designed a custom graphics card that would use that. Um, and then we needed to have a large amount of memory to hold all of the sprites. So we built, um, uh, I think it was like, like two feet by two feet, it was huge. And it held, it held 16 megabytes of memory, which at the time was a pretty big deal. Um, and so you had this Amiga, and then you had this big cage built around the Amiga to hold these custom cards that were then put into the Amiga, and they dwarfed the Amiga, you know? So at the end of the result, the custom card ran the, the viewport and the Amiga's uh, video output ran the radar screen. Um, and then all the rest of it, uh, there was an IO card that they that had been designed to handle all the buttons and switches. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was pretty custom even from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, the artwork and the design of everything that went into those cockpits was, was amazing. And one of, the, one of the people who has, you know, um, in the history of Battletech sometimes does not get a lot of, you know, the acknowledgement is Tim Skelly and how Tim Skelly was working on the art, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, to help develop the original looks of the mechs for the prototypes. Yeah, so Tim was great. Uh, and we, that, you know, that's where the whole clans came from, is that Tim, um, uh, you know, we, 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 we realized we had to do it in a kind of component basis. We didn't have enough memory to have unique mech, uh, unique mech, mechs, right? So we had, uh, two sets of legs. We had four torsos. We had uh, two sets, uh, four sets of arms, right? And that was it. All the mechs were made out of those pieces by swapping them around. Um, and so, um, and we came up with that approach. And then, and then, yeah, the the look of like the Mad Cat um, and uh, the Vulture and you know Loki. I mean, some of these really iconic ones were really were were developed by uh, you know. Tim and obviously our guys were all kibitzing on that. I mean, our, mm -hmm. our FASA so team was wasn't, wasn't, wasn't Dwayne Luce one of the guys? So yeah, Dwayne did a lot of the early sketching. I mean, so there's no question that Dwayne, mm -hmm. yeah, Dwayne established the aesthetic. I mean, everything from the cockpits to the to the you know decorations of the of the uh, the center and and a lot of the mechs too. I mean, there there was no question. It was a collaborative effort there. But mm -hmm. yeah, so the prototype comes together and there's two joysticks for targeting. There's the center throttle for control and two pedals, and then all the weapons displays. So you guys work on this and it comes together and there's some incredible design work to get this system up and running. What was it like the first time a civilian, somebody who was truly rookie, sat down in one of these cockpits and saw what this thing was? Before we got that though, we had an awful lot of things that didn't work. <laughs> right. A lot of demonstrations that were disastrous. Uh, yeah, as that implies and Mort said, yeah, there was a lot of blind alleys we went down. I remember one that I was super excited about, which was solenoids in the joysticks, so that when you pulled the trigger, you felt the <laughs> kick of the guns, you know? Yeah, that was a really bad idea. Um, 
<laughs> but we built it and tried it. <laughs> and then there was the whole kind of dual rotating joysticks, um, you know, for being able to uh, uh, spin the, yeah, the original, there was one, one joystick twi twisted the, the, the torso and the other joystick steered, right? Before we got to the foot pedals steering. Um, so there was a lot of trying. As I was putting this together, I was talking to Bill Redman and Bill told me a story about as the, uh, before the center opens, I believe, about the cockpits being evaluated by another company and what that entertainment outreach was like. Bill, could you, could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm sure that was actually back during the prototypes because I first met Jordan uh, when Origins uh, located in Los Angeles for a year. And the booth, I, I walked by the booth, they had a videotape playing and I'm like, what, what am I seeing? What, what, what is this? And it was, you know, there, there's some screen capture. There was over the shoulder of somebody working the switches. And I'm like, what's going on? So Jordan and I ended up having lunch. I had recently started working for Disney Imagineering at the time. At the time it was, uh, 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 no, 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 this was, this was post wed. It was now called Imagineering. And I was in the R and D group and, it's like, oh my gosh, this is this is like so far ahead of what's going on. And it's like, shoot, they're only building that stuff now. Jose's working on it. It and it was it was just incredible. And at the time, uh, the, the the systems were prototypes. Uh, they were they were in Chicago. You know, I I took the details and the business card, and there and, and there there wasn't any pictures or handouts or anything. It was just, I mean, because it was a FASA booth and they were selling games and, but they had this, what we're doing with, <laughs> in our spare time. <laughs> and so I took that back. We ended up uh, visiting uh, uh, heads of the creative and technical heads of R and D um, and, and visited the ESP uh, offices and nothing was working. It was, it was a beautiful cockpit. You could actually sit down, but you couldn't couldn't light it up. <laughs> but but we kept in touch. I mean, it would, and we would like you know liked all the people, and 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 it was fascinating. And uh, 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 shoot, I don't remember how how much time later it was, but they were all working, and uh, uh, Disney rented them essentially for a week. They they were all loaded onto a truck and shipped out to Glendale and set up in the Disney uh, Imagineery facilities. And we operated them, I think for three straight days. And the Imagineers would just pour through, come back, you know, play as often as you want. But every time you played, you had to fill out our four page questionnaire. <coughs> the user response we wanted to see, you know, it's like, is the reaction consistent across plays? You know, does, does, it, does it wane? Does your skill get better? How, how, how does it play out? And my favorite, pattern in that questionnaire was you know question number one and I, I wasn't in favor of this question but but some somebody you know was concerned you know does the violence inherent in the game offend you I'm like, yeah then on the back page you know, fourth page of the questionnaire what was your favorite thing about the game <laughs> blowing up my friends <laughs> <laughs> that was that was terrific so uh, uh, Jordan and I were talking about, you know, how, how would Disney use this? And at the time, uh, America Sings had closed. All the robots were taken out. The animatronics were taken out and put into Splash Mountain. And so that facility had been dormant. And we were kind of coming up with a com concept of how you could sprinkle those simulators around the turntable of the Carousel Theater. And you'd go in via the top and come down and you'd emerge and you'd climb into cockpits and then they'd move and they'd move and they'd move and then they'd move and eventually you'd, you'd leave ha having played, you know, like a 15 minute game or something like that with some good pre-show, some good post-show. And we're playing with that idea. Didn't go anywhere. Should have. I, I remember because we were, we, we would often be there pretty late at night because a lot of people want to hang out and play all night, you know, and, uh, and it was no so way. Fun. Uh, that, that was the only way I'd get my turn. <laughs> <laughs> and so at some point at night, I was heading for the bathroom and I opened a door and I literally bounced my head off of someone's chest and I look up and it's, it's Eisner, um, who I don't know what he was doing in Imagineering at, at, late at night. 
But that was the first time I met Michael Eisner, which was literally running into him flat on. <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, I did, so I did get, is, counter to advice, I did enjoy trying the uh, dual targeting joysticks. <laughs> <laughs> And then there was, um, we would keep, the problem is we would keep running out of money, right? Because we were so far off on the budget. We would keep running out of money and then we'd have to go do things, <clears throat> crazy stuff to, uh, to keep the project alive. Um, uh, and that included uh, uh, the infamous um, uh, laser tag system that kept, uh, <laughs> <laughs> kept uh, Ross in, in Japan long enough to be able to know all of the Japanese soap operas by heart. It's important, it's important to know that story because it was Dan, Dwayne Luce who introduced us to a man named Ura, M-U-R-I-A. Richard Nibley. That's right, it was Richard, yeah. yeah. Was and Richard, Richard uh, yeah. I, was, I was in Japan on a boondoggle trip by the state of Illinois to take our Star Trek game and miniatures over there to sell to the Japanese. But part of it was Richard and I went and I did a presentation for the cockpit game with Urison at Diflex in 1988. And, you know, he told me later that that was enough to convince him to, to believe us. And I think end of 88, beginning of 89, he came over with his team and, you know, we started talking about how this was all going to work. But while he was doing that, he also told us about this other problem he had with a with a, a shooting game. And he sort of looked at the table, looked over at Jordan. You said, you know, what do you think of this? And Jordan in his inimitable, inimitable style said, sure, we can do that. Can and that. that started that saga, which, you know, it, when it totaled up, I spent, I made 20 trips to Japan, spent about a year there over the 20 trips, uh, half of which was for babysitting the laser shooting game. Mm. <laughs> and so Which one of the urban legends about the laser shooting game is the power of the onboard laser and whether that was correct for the time. Does anybody want to comment on that? Uh, unbeknownst to us, every time somebody pulled the trigger, the laser would fire. And 50% of the time in the beginning, it would fry the microprocessor and freeze the gun. <laughs> uh, it took us a while to figure that out. And... Uh, but that was that. But the biggest issue we were having in Japan was was related to the grounding of the facility. Oh, uh, it it was not a user friendly place. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but that to me is a great kind of cultural story, right? Where we said all the outlets have to be grounded because all there was that's how the communication was being done on, on the back end of the system, and they said, "Yep, every outlet is grounded." And I mean, Ross repeated that multiple times over multiple months. And they kept getting assured every everything is grounded, and it was like on month like four, or five, or six—I can't remember—it was like really long that that you finally realized when they said grounded, they meant every outlet was individually grounded, so there was no common ground in the building. Oh. <laughs> but that was just purely a language problem. If we had if we had solved that, the thing would have been working months earlier. Oh. So the systems are coming together, the prototypes are coming together. And so time, timelines were starting to get towards 1989 and in the summer of 1989, we're now, you know, you guys have worked together and the prototype system is a four cockpit demo unit that starts to be shown off. And that summer of 1989 is the big summer with summer CES where they're kind of like, you know, the big reveal to the world. What was the buildup like to get those four player units together and talking to get ready for that first, you know, real reveal was the detroit auto show before was, was before gonna, that right i was going to say that was actually the, the the premiere of our tech was actually at the detroit auto show not in the cockpits okay uh, and that was in the winter of uh that was january of uh 89 I, I think so yeah yeah, um, yeah. that was where the public first got their hands on it i do want to mention one thing that that hadn't been mentioned we were we were so far over our head financially in the fall of 89, that we were about ready to cause, create bankruptcy for everything. And uh, we had a, had this nice relationship with Murasan in Japan. And I went there over one weekend and told him 
what was going on and that we were we were going to go under. And he said, how much do you need? And I said, $400,000. Now, this is $400,000 30 years ago, folks. And it was in the bank account before I got off the plane on my way home. He, he was the most honorable man I've ever done business with. And we still stay in touch, he and I. Mm. Yeah, no, true partner. So at the Detroit Auto Show then, so people sit, you know, at the, Det the Detroit Auto Show audience is not what somebody would generally say is, you know, a mech sim audience. So you're there with new cars. What was the, re the audience reaction to seeing these simulators? Well, they were driving Jeeps, right? Oh. So we had been hired, um, again, we always run out of money, right? <clears throat> mm -hmm. and, and I don't remember how this opportunity came across the transom, but um, they, they were, Jeep wanted a fancy, fun experience for the auto show and had somehow seen what we were doing. I don't remember how that came together. Uh, and so we signed up to say, yeah, absolutely. In a ridiculously short period of time, we'll use our system to, uh, to create a networked Jeep experience for you. And, uh, and so we built a whole new cockpit using actual steering wheels and gas and gas pedals and, and gear shifts, uh, for, from the Jeeps. Um, and a, uh, it was like a Baja off-road race, um, with, uh, with the Jeeps and you could jump over each other and run into each other and, you know, all sorts of, uh, all sorts of fun. And it was, yeah, it, it got them a huge amount of press. It was a big hit. Mm. And so then that move, the next move would then be to CES then a couple months later? Between my travels to Japan and all, all I remember about CES is watching Mort uh, with the roll in his hand, dealing with the union guys uh, to help us set up. Mm. And well, I remember that. Stuff. Now I remember that. Yeah, it was, it was at McCormick Place, right? Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. and Do you remember the fight that broke out? Because we were setting up the booth and uh, it's right. a union shop. And, uh, and one of the carpenters, you have to use the carpenters union to set up the booth. And one of them screwed in a light bulb, and one of the guys from the electricians' union saw that, and right. came storming into the booth, and they literally got in a fist fight in the middle of our booth <laughs> while we were trying to set up for the show. This is Eyewitness News with John Drury and Diane Burns, Steve Dushler's weather, Tim Weigel on sports, and the Eyewitness News team. And later. A sneak preview of the hottest new video game, Battletech. What has 13 miles of aisles, 17 football fields of new electronic products, and over 1,300 electrifying exhibits? Frank Matthey has the answer. Today was last-minute preparations day for the four-day-long show. Final setup, checklist, checkout time. There used to be just one of these shows, but now there are so many new electronic products coming on the market, two shows a year are needed for the latest in everything to make our lives easier and more fun. Do you remember the original video game? 20 years ago, Pong, it was the game of its time, but how times change, this is the latest Battletech invented by two young Chicago men. When Battletech hits the market in several months, it will be more than just an arcade game. You don't play against a computer, you battle other players. So you have human skill versus human skill. It's not a redundant computer that's just memorizing cycles. You have to play against someone who's got imagination and creativity. So it will be man against man. No one gets hurt, of course. It's just battling graphics controlled by individual players. Disneyland or a movie is a passive entertainment. You can't control the story. Here, in our thing, you get in the cockpit, you're the hero. They hope to open Battletech centers around the world. It has been eight years in the making at the cost of one million dollars. What if it fails? Well, then we have the world's greatest home entertainment system that we'll put in one of our basements. <laughs> the first Battletech Center will open in Chicago towards the end of the year. No, it's not a quarter game. It'll cost about $6 for half an hour. Frank Matthew, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. So, so when CES is up and running, that's, that's also when a lot, of, um, you know, a lot of concept art is now out there because there's that original concept art, which now shows the Battletech Center concept and the idea of... There's an observation deck, and there's uh, all the different components of the actual center are actually coming together. As, as that idea comes together, 
when, how did it move from being just the sim to saying now also at the end of that experience, we're, we're, we have to expand the experience to these other areas for a player to get into the, you know, into the game world. How did that develop? Well, that was ripped off from Disney. Um, I mean, I, you know, Donna and I, my wife and I have been going to Disney, you know, forever and filling notebooks about like this kind of environmental, you know, immersion experience. Uh, and so the whole idea of kind of the pre-show and the kind of ramping into the experience and, and the social dynamics of that, um, you know, were, were something that we felt very positive, we were very excited about from the beginning. I remember Don and I spent all nights working on these models and actually Venters helped on that too building this big model of a, of a center to show that to uh, Mr. Mira. It was this cool release. I wish I still had that model. It was super cool. Um, and, and so that, that was always part of the experience. I think to me, one of the, what turned out to be the most important part, um, we always knew that we wanted the post show to, uh, to bring the players together, right? Cause you've been off in your own cockpits uh, and virtually connected. We wanted the post show to connect you. Right. But, we didn't have any content to put there. And that was really, I think one of the, uh, to me, one of the bigger and more important innovations that Greg introduced was uh, being, you know, the, the idea and then the, uh, the first version of how to record the network events. Um, this was much later, so after we opened, because this was about, I don't think this was introduced until like six months or a year after we opened. I can't remember what the timing was when it was, Greg, maybe you do. I don't remember exactly when. I mean, I, I remember that my first meeting with you guys was actually at CES, though. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. But but to me, that's that was <laughs> the capture and then replay those. The experience for the audience became, I think, one of the most important parts of the social dynamic circle um, uh, of the experience. So. so, so Greg, at that CES, what did you think of those cockpits and that in that technology when you saw it? I thought it was really pretty cool. I was I was just coming off of uh, working in the indust industry of uh, factory control stuff, so I was actually working on controlling things like blast furnaces and steel rolling mills. And uh, you know, the the thing I was uh, I noticed when I was at uh, CES was they at the time I was there they seemed to have, be having a lot of trouble with the cockpits. Um, you know, they were sometimes working and sometimes not, and since uh, I'd spent all this time debugging stuff for the steel mill industry where, you know, like when you're playing with giant bars of steel at, at 2000 degrees shooting around at 60 miles an hour, you don't get to have bugs in your code, <laughs> you know? So I'd piled up a lot of experience in debugging stuff. And, uh, you know, it turned out that I think it was five or six months after CES, I saw a show um, on television about uh, the Battletech stuff. And uh, I, I thought, hey, that's the guy I met at CES. He's still around. <laughs> Maybe I should call him up and see if I can help him out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that's kind of how it how I ended up stuck in the thing. <laughs> so, so we moved from the prototypes, and we actually now are starting to get actually into the first the first store is ready to go at you know Navy at um, North Pier. How did that move from getting you know the backers and in, internally within the own the own company to be able to get the store open. What type of fight was that to actually get the center opened in the first place? And boy, is it only a year? It seemed like a long time. It seemed to me like it was multiple years, but I, time is not my, I don't do time really well. Um, <laughs> because there was a long period of time, my, mentally at least, where, where we had the cockpits in the FASA warehouse. And whenever people would come into town, like for CES or for other conventions, we would get these waves of people coming over to play them. It's like, we got really close with like the Nintendo guys because they would come over and play them all the time when they were in town. So there was a, there was a long period of, of, of that. And we were, we were trying to find the funds to be able to open up a store, right? To open up the first center. Because again, in a repeating cycle, we were out of money. <clears throat> um, and uh, we had some really interesting discussions with, um, was it the Pritzkers, Mort? Is that right? Yes, it didn't go anywhere. Yeah, so, so they, got, they got interested. And um, they said, well, we, we would need someone in our organization who can understand this. And the only guy is, I can't remember his name. Um, and, uh, but he's, so they brought him over and he spent a couple of days with us and he said, yeah, it's really cool, but I, we're starting this little ticket thing. I'm gonna stick with that. That was Ticketmaster. Um, and uh, so he didn't come over to run it and they didn't invest. Um, and then I think we, 
we, it was somehow, it was a convention display company who became kind of our partners on the store, on that first store, wasn't it? Yes, Ross, remember? Yeah, father, I mean, uh, two brothers who were father. Father and son, and their business was to make displays, store displays. And they were intrigued by what we were doing, and they actually bought a piece of the company by building the Battle Deck Center out for us. They were the ones who did all the construction. We, we supplied the pods and the electronics, but they did, they did the, everything else. Then they wanted out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so now we're going to start actually having a, a, a bigger discussion because now the center is there and now we're starting to see other people are getting involved. So Jose, did you, you started as a player before you got, uh, actually started working at the center, correct? Yeah. I saw a couple of magazines in there. I was ex-military, so I loved simulators and I was in grad school. So I had started playing. And then I couldn't afford it on a stupid grad student salary. So I started working there. Mm -hmm. And I started hanging out with the techs and I started fixing the stuff. And one day Jordan comes by, he basically kicks me in the foot when he finds out that I'm actually working in a cockpit. And he asks me, what are you doing in there? And I was telling him about the things that I was finding. And he called me up and he said, well, what are you doing Monday? And I said, I don't know. And he just said, yeah give me his card and i said and says i'd like to talk to you about a position and that's where i started david abzug how did you how did you get involved i used to run a comic book shop to help work my way through college and i was down the street from a gaming store run by a guy named phil stenson and phil got hired as the first general manager of the battletech center and right about the time i was graduating college he gave me a phone call and he said so you like battletech are you interested in a job um, and I, I'm very proud that just because my last name starts with AB, I was the first Star Wars employee hired because I was at the top of the pile. <laughs> and according to legend, Mort looked at my picture and said, why do they all have to look like gamers? <laughs> um, I think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I just, I thought I'd give it, I was working at Channel 38 as a tech director at the time. And so I started part-time and then I said, you know, let's give it a few months and see what happens. And then I gave it a few more months and then I gave it a few more months. Then it was about 10 years later. So, <laughs> so Paul Tierney, you start as also, you know, a player. What was your first introduction to the Battletech Center? My first introduction to the center came through used books. Um, I was going, I was living in Lakeview before it became gentrified. And there was a Powell's bookstore there and I was combing the used books for something to read. And I came across one of the first Battletech novels. And that is how I got into Battletech. And I was trying to, and there were few and far between. So whenever they come out, I'd snatch them up and I'm reading them. And one day I'm at my apartment, I'm in the shower and I hear an ad and I think it's WXRT. It's the 31st century. And that was the first ad for the BTC. <laughs> You're at the helm of a 30 foot walking tank and I'm out of the shower dripping on what is this? What is this? What is this? And it's, it's battle tech. I'm like, Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Get out of the shower, dry off. I call the center. It's like, do you guys take reservations? I got a reservation. I was down the next day. And I have, playing. I have that reservation because our reservation <laughs> system at the time was literally a book where we'd write things in <laughs> and I can go get that reservation book and show you your first ever phone res. <laughs> All right. And so wow. I've saved it this whole time. All right. I, I think I might still have my card. This is in October. The center opened in July and I mm -hmm. had my first game at the beginning of October <laughs> and I got hooked and, um, you know, I was an aspiring actor and I was waiting tables and I, and unlike, you know, Jose and, and David who got hired on, I, I funded my habit via credit cards. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was going down and I was playing it about three times a week and uh, that was it, you know, and I was player for three years before I ended up getting hired on to go open the center in San Diego with David as the assistant manager there. Um, so I was a customer for a longer period than either of the other two. Now we move from prototype to actual what's mm -hmm. in the store and the, you know, the platform starts to change. And so we go to a single joystick and, you know, movement of the throttle as the store is open. When does that line start to get drawn about, okay, we're going to start developing the next platform with system two and 
moving into the next generation because the timeline has to be somewhat close to that of to be able to hit 92 for Yokohama actually opening. I was always feeling that we were, people were right behind us, that we needed to move, move to the next generation. We needed to build it better and bigger. And, and, um, and uh, you know, so we needed a new hardware platform. We didn't, we were, we were years ahead and we should have stuck with that version one of hardware. We all uh, told you that well, except for you. I, no, I know. I know. It's totally my fault. <laughs> I completely agree. In, in Jordan's defense, I'd say version one of hardware had some, there were a couple of things that we didn't predict as to how the, how the cockpits would behave in the stores. Um, what I remember the most about version one was that the potentiometers we used for the foot pedals were originally used for racing games. And in racing games, you put your foot down on the pedal and you keep it there. But in the Battletech cockpits, you use the pedals to turn. And so you're slamming them back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And we had, and I think Ross, Ross I remember Ross was a huge amount of help when this happened. We had pretty much every potentiometer in the site break over the course of a two week period. Because um, well, they all hit the end of their operating life. Well, that's, David, that's when I started working with the techs. Because yeah. they found out that I was, I was an engineer and figuring it out. And that was part of the conversation that you had with me, Jordan, was what was going on. And I said things about the potentiometers. I also said about the design of the joysticks, the mm -hmm. switches. So if we had just fixed a lot of the incremental problems with the I.O., I think it would have had a much better lifetime. I, I agree. I agree. And, and you know, so we were, and we, yet we didn't invest in that because we were too focused on, like, a whole new generation, you know? As a player, pure player at this point, I got invited to do some of the play testing at CERMAC for System 2. And that, you know, I love System 1. It's a great game, but it played completely different. The style was very, very different. It was when we get into System 2 where we start to see torso twisting as being the main way of playing the game. You know, the games changed from being a, a, a slashing pattern, passing each other, and coming around and doing another pass, except for the Loki 3 pillbox, then we're doing circling turns. And as a player, the system two cockpits and that style of play was very, very, very entertaining. You know, that was a lot of fun. So on, on that aspect, simply as just as a player, while I enjoyed them both going over to the system two platform and the way the cockpits were controlled and the way they controlled the mechs, I think that, and the, and the graphics were better as well. The, the play was much more uh, involving for me as a pure player than System 1. It was, it was more involving for the experienced players, for people like you and for, I remember Tim Swab, $1.35 plus tax, pointing out that he had two choices, Battletech or a new car. Um, and he'd gone with Battletech. Um, for people like that, it was. Yeah. 2.0. Had some, had some problems, though, in teaching the newer players because Torso Twist was so important. Yeah. And teaching the average person that they're running one direction and looking another yeah, um, was quite difficult. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, I think while the graphics were technically much more sophisticated, right, because they were polygonal, it was 3D, we could move the cameras in all sorts of interesting ways. It, made, it, it was a big advancement in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't as cinematic. Mm -hmm. the, the flat system. shading hurt it hurt yeah. it a lot yeah because we had no we had, you know we only had flat shading we didn't have very many colors mm -hmm. um and so i think at first blush system one actually looks better than system mm -hmm. two because, mm -hmm. because you know uh, because of those limitations and i think that was a, a an interesting challenge as well um and uh and this was partially driven by mr mura too he was mr mura was was not blown away by system one's results Right, and he wanted a, a true 3D environment, and so that was he was he was an encouragement to to move forward. Not that he was requiring it, but it was a it was an encouragement. He did like System Two better at the mm -hmm. end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was. Uh, but it was it, it meant that you know develop a whole new hardware platform, redevelop all the software, right? Um, so that that was a it was it was a well disastrous is maybe too strong a word, but certainly <laughs> less than ideal financial choice. Dave, well, did, you, did you join at this point where, for this portion of System 2 development, or were you later on when you started to get involved? Uh, no, I did, I did get involved uh, 
The interesting thing there was originally, because of the uh, chip you guys were talking about that uh, was originally dedicated to doing, um, you know, video graphics, was going to allow texture mapping on all those polygonal surfaces. Um, and so that was going to be a spectacular move forward. Uh, but then it was realized that um, the memory requirements in order to feed the textures for those systems had not been accounted for in the hardware design. And so uh, the system dropped back to flat polygonal shading, uh, uh, which was interesting because I came from post-production and was totally excited to what we'd be able to do with this texture mapping system. And this was just going to be like beating everything that was out there. And then they were like, uh, there's going to be a small change. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> instead of actually having the ability to put images on the screen, what you'll be able to do is put flat shaded polygons on the screen. But you can have 700 of them. So uh, extremely, extremely uh, high well, that, fidelity. That, that video memory was the single most expensive component of the whole cockpit at that point in time in history. Mm -hmm. um, that was that was where a lot of the the cash flow went to, to buy those buy those chips. So Greg, when you were on when you came on board at the end of system one and starting to plug into system two, how did how did you work on the new platform? What was what were some of the big things for you as they moved to a new platform? Uh, well I was just kind of digging into all the hardware and trying to get the most out of it that we could because it you know we had several different processors all stacked up in that box. I mean I think there was a like the the Amiga, there was a Motorola processor, there was a TI processor, and there was a TI floating point processor, and you could program them all. <laughs> and they were all programmed in different languages. So it was sort of like trying to, to figure out how to get the most out of all of them. And I, I mean, eventually we figured out that the floating point unit actually worked really good for drawing polygons as well. And, uh, you know, a lot of other things like that. And it it, it took a lot of messing about to get the each one of the processors to kind of pitch in and do as much as it possibly could to keep the thing going. And the, the system too is also where we brought all of that in house, right? I mean, we were yeah. uh, the uh, incredible technologies had kind of you know ended with with system one, and system two was a, was an all in house development. Mm -hmm. But at the end of system two, also for so system two BattleTech starts to roll out, and another new voice starts to get added for a six week quick job that ended up being much longer, and that would be J.M. Albertson. <laughs> J.M., what was that like when you and Eric started to expand on Mission Review? Er Eric wasn't on, on yet when I got hired in. So first I was hired in as a contractor for four weeks. And in the four weeks, I was supposed to build an animation editor, the network driver for the A-Rose card, get that working, and do Mission Review on a Mac that I'd never touched before in my life. So somehow they agreed that hey he's the guy to go do this and i remember walking through those dark tunnels to get into the interior of cermak and then looking and seeing that whole burned out section but <laughs> what in the <laughs> hell <laughs> and so i'm terrified of what i have signed up for and it's like what the hell am i it was the most bizarre day go ahead oh i was gonna say i remember being in the building at like 3 a.m because uh, going home at 3 a.m. was pretty typical of the work schedule at that time. Um, and uh, was working on something, and I heard a whole bunch of sirens outside, and I was like, oh, there must be a fire somewhere. <laughs> and I looked out the window, and there was like a hook and ladder coming up the side of the building. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> there's a fire here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So the building was on fire and it was like, oh, well, this is exciting. This is a nice, nice, simple, high-tech business to be involved in, <laughs> catching I, on I, fire I, I, in a piano fiac, in a piano yeah. factory. Yeah. Well, the, the building had character, no doubt. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Because I also remember a story about um, Chicago PD visiting the offices late one night and also picking up a game because they had been called into, you know, investigate something suspicious in that building. Is this one with the dogs and the toy guns? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah this was remember. later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I came in on Sunday morning. I found all my toy, my toy ammo was everywhere. It was scattered all over. And I had the rule, if you use my guns, you put the ammo back or you can't use my guns. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of pissed off. Picked up all the ammo, put it back, and I was going to read someone the riot act. 
the next day on Monday when I, when uh, I, I came in, Garth was there and he goes, oh, I know what that was. And he proceeds to tell me the story where he's sitting at like 10, 8, 10 p.m. at night. He's got his headphones on and he's typing away and just hears this weird noise, takes the headphones off, looks out the corner and there's these two cops just going at each other with the, with the Nerf guns. And he goes, <laughs> excuse me. And they suddenly turn around with their hands, you know, to the the gun, guns. and he's like, don't shoot me. Don't shoot me. <laughs> and uh, what he's like, what are you doing here? And apparently they had left the dog run around trying to snoop for the burglar. So there was, this is as he tells, there was actually a dog loose somewhere. <laughs> and the cops decided, well, actually, no, guns are more fun. We'll take, the dog will take care of the burglar, I guess. <laughs> I, re I remember that, that animation system that you built, because at the time, computer software really didn't, was not even close to that, even in the very, very high end silicon graphic tools or everything like that. And we had done some really cool stuff with animation and we were kind of happy with it. And uh, I remember later uh, we had a visitor who said, we're really interested in what you're doing with animation. And they're like, well, it's probably somebody who doesn't understand animation very well, but we'll try to explain it to him. I went, it's Roy Disney. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to see what you guys are doing uh, just because they're interested in getting into computer animation at the Disney company. So, uh, JM's tool uh, wound up uh, helping influence, uh, I guess, Disney's going, yeah, there might be something here with this computer animation stuff. Well, I remember in that first week, we actually, Dave and I had an interesting disagreement because he had asked for this linear XYZ thing. And I was like trying to drive it and go, this is, to me, it was like, this is impossible to drive. Why, why wouldn't you want an orbit cam? And Dave, being super stressed, was like, build the thing I want. I'm like, okay, I'll build the thing you want. And I built my thing. Because I was like, but this is, I think, what you need more of. And I did kind of, I went a little off the uh, the track there, but I think he ended up using both systems pretty pretty well. So I was happy well, I had done that. Well, the fact is, is, as was typical with our later Red Planet, every time I got into a disagreement with JM, typically I would argue vehemently and eventually realize that he was right. The orbit system <laughs> that he devised was not at all what I specified but it yeah. is in fact what is universally used in animation systems. So. Well, yeah, and I think overall the idea, you know, if you look at what's happened over the last, you know, 30 years, I mean that uh, the system of being able to live direct and film, um, live, you know, real-time games, um, uh, I mean, that is the industry at this point, right? I mean, and we, I don't, I don't believe anybody had built tools anything like that at in at that nope. era. No, I wish we had them for filming that first trailer for Red Planet. If you remember that weekend. <laughs> <Holy God. laughs> um, th this brings up some uh, some other again interesting, um, you know, nuts and bolts of the original system. The original System One game design frequently centered around, or originally was pitched to be more, you know, team only, and then it free-for-all fights didn't you know mm -hmm. uh, evolve into the gameplay until much later jordan what jordan and ross what did you think about that original idea of, of selling the experience as being you know a team experience versus an individual experience well remember that that's what esp started out doing it was a team <laughs> game a collaborative thing mm -hmm. and that you know that stayed a lot that stayed in until uh you know until people decided you know I'd rather shoot anybody that, that I see rather than work as a team. Yeah, I think uh, Ross is absolutely right. And I think one of the things, like we started with the bridge and as we started kind of thinking through the kind of social dynamics of the bridge and the economics of it, we got concerned that you couldn't fill all the seats, right? That you would, you would be uncomfortable to work with a stranger on a bridge where the, there would be no way to evaluate your individual performance because it's, it's only the collaborative performance that's evaluated. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's why the idea of shifting to a team where you still had the team structure, but you had a way to at least individually have success, right? So that uh, we may have lost as a team, but at least I performed well. Um, and, and of course, Battletech, the success of Battletech was a major swing in that, right? As Battletech went crazy, that's when it became about Battletech. Well, we, we again, we we when we got further and further along, we had to say, okay, what kind of game is it going to be? And 
we looked at each other and said, Battletech gives us a built-in audience to start with, and, you know, the rest is history. I, I found that a fascinating lesson because that was my first experience with user research, was watching fans in the cockpits for System 1 saying, screw the score sheet and just blowing each other up. And then sitting down afterwards at mission review once we got once we got score sheets and trying to figure out who had actually won because you got negative points for shooting your teammates. <laughs> and so they'd go to that level of they go to that level of effort. See, and then we started reporting that to the office. And that was my first experience with seeing what seeing what the people actually playing the game do and then trying to adjust the game to fit that. So and, and uh, the, the, those score sheets, mm -hmm. they they were, I think, enormously important. I mean, they oh. became this kind of manifestation, this codification of this temporal event, right? I mean, the, and and people kept notebooks of them, and they they it's it was interesting. Just they had a very like one of those kind of like outsized response to the effort, right? I mean, mm -hmm. they, from a technology standpoint, it wasn't that big a deal, but the the impact it had on the player community and the repeat player and the dynamics was huge. I still have a lot of my score sheets from notable matches. Mm -hmm. yep. I remember yeah, I an to... awful lot of people, the, the, it, when, when we started out, they were sort of like, yeah, score sheets. And within a really short period of time, everybody was like running to be the first one at the printer to grab, to <laughs> grab their sheets. Well, you know? And as right. we started to, you know, to, to create little parsers that assembled it as more and more of a narrative it got richer and richer and people mm -hmm. yeah it became a story that you could go back so you had the experience and then you had the joy the fun of watching it on the review system where you almost went win or lose this is a blast and then when you finished watching the review you went out and got your score sheet and now you had this story about the fight that you had and it was like you know it didn't just say well you got this many points or anything it was with all these things like takes a sacrificial blow and is crushed by, you know. and so it was like, well, I died, but I died in glory. <laughs> so, so, so much time and effort is built into, you know, making these one, these wonderful platforms from system one. And as we start to move mm -hmm. into system two and shortly into system three, and we're going to be winding it up here in a little bit, but so you have Battletech and Battletech has become, you know, the name, the name, the marquee name for the center. So how did we go about or how to start to explore other titles for The Sims? Because, you know, there's a discussion. Uh, I talked with Charlie Fink uh, last year, and Charlie said when he was first introduced to the center, one of the things, or into a virtual world, he, he commented about Aerotech being developed. And how did that path of other titles start to get worked on? Well, I mean, I think we always wanted it. We, did, we didn't want it to be a one title place from the beginning. We, we narrowed our vision to that because that's what financing and, and we had, as Ross said, a built-in audience and it was the right thing from a positioning point of view. But with Tim's involvement, you know, one of the things uh, Tim Disney is, Tim and Ch Charlie got involved in, and, you know, we, we actually had funding. Um, you know, we saw that as an opportunity to, to, to broaden uh, the tent and, and to try to create a center that could become uh, a host to what we hoped would be a large number of different experiences. Uh, so that's where, you know, we created the kind of metafiction of the virtual geographic league and we centered the theming around that, that kind of portal, that, that, that uh, stepping off point that we could go into all these different universes. Um, and uh, I don't remember where the original pitch for Red Planet came from. Well, it started as Necropolis. It was going to be some kind of crazy hunt through the city of the dead, some archaeology, no guns, no, it was, it was this puzzle game. Right. That no was the guns. original that was the thing. Critical thing. No guns. We have to be peaceful. It's Disney. <laughs> <laughs> but but there was a lot of work originally into try to pull off this necropolis thing. And totally I sure. was the junior guy there and I said, Hey, you know, Greg is, you know, completely dedicated to making Battletech go forward. He's like, here, you new guy, just put something kind of together. And so I built like a VTV and it was a lot of crap, but there was some, there, there was a little thing it had that it was kind of fun to drive, but it was utterly different than any other thing we had. But it was just, remember driving around the VTVs the first time in Battletech land. 
And it was just kind of yes. this weird. Woof, woof, woof. I, don't I don't know remember. what I could yeah. do with it, but you know, well, I, I let me know when the city shows up. <laughs> yeah, but but then but then of course we started running into each other, and we know what happens next. Right, well, that's what changed. At first, it, does everybody remember the Velcro? Because the collisions were completely Velcro for a long time. You'd hit, yeah, and they would yep. stick, and you get these molecule chains of vehicles. <laughs> Uh, but, but Martian football didn't come in until I mean, we you know we built it like we built it as a pure racing game, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then Martian football, you know, was introduced. There, there was one but, thing, critical thing that did happen when we had the flying part, and we originally had it was a we had the doors that were going to kind of try to bunch people up because everyone would separate because there were going to be yeah. long courses, and we even filmed the uh, when we were filming that that movie at the time to make the doors open and close you had to nudge the thing and so poor fred tyfelt he had to sit there for two days i remember this image of like he had these aviator sunglasses on as this white cube is going because he has to sit right in front of the cube and nudge the cube and we're going to go do this take after take to try to get the driving through the doors right and it looks straight out of some horrible science experiment gone terribly wrong it was awesome right but no, it was Jordan, when you came up with the, yeah, when that came in, all of a sudden, it was like, hey, it's Indy 500 with half the cars going the other way. Okay, there's that. And that's when the game took on, it was still no guns, but mm -hmm. it took on a thing. And I, I think at that point, we, we also started our first skunk works, or at least the first skunk works I was involved with there, where we really, we thought there should be guns. Oh, the and elves. Like, no, yeah, the elves. Yes, the elf, the elf yeah. project. Right. Yeah, we thought there should be guns, like no guns. Well, we'll secretly make guns. <laughs> right. And in then we just show them to the time head office. We show them to the head office. Yes, and landmines and everything else. And it's like, no guns, no guns. It's like, okay, fine. These are Play tools. The tools. No They're guns. tools. But optionally, since we were here till 3 a.m., there do happen to be guns available. If you want. I think we were very clear that you, you could misuse your tools. We don't suggest you, you do it, right. but you, you could. They weren't actually guns. They were riveting they were machines yeah. and arc Laser welders. And so yeah. they, totally. so we, we met the prescription that there were no guns. <laughs> so one of the interesting things about Red Planet, especially as we move later into Martian football, uh becoming you know one of the key games at at the center so you have a multiplayer game where you have really clearly defined roles for the player uh in battle tech you know you have different weapon loadouts but for football you had really defined player roles in a multiplayer game so you know the team dynamics is very different in martian football um how do you think you know looking back on it as a multiplayer game with you know that type of team dynamic how that developed compared to what we see today? Well, I, I mean, I think, I mean, to me, that was one of the big differences why Red Planet slash Martian football worked as a, as a true team game and Battletech less so, right? There was very, there were, the d differentiation of the roles in Battletech was really minor, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you didn't have that identification of like, oh, there's a quarterback, there's a receiver, there's a blocker, there's, you know, there's, there's like clear roles to play, which, you know, which is what all of uh, kind of shooters became, right? Uh, you know, shooters where you started to really have these kind of codified roles within the team mm -hmm. dynamic. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that was really to, you know, Jam and, and the group that, that invented Martian football that really kind of envisioned I, I, that I will, much more. Yeah, I will say I take, that is probably my single, single contribution to game design was I actually, I did come up with Martian football, like in a weekend of just kind of, okay, take rock, paper, scissors and put, and put engines on it and how does this work <laughs> I, I and that was kind of the theory i don't know if this was planned but one of the results of that in, in terms of, and i actually use this as an example in my classes is that by giving by giving the players boxes that they got to stay inside of you, your job is to go back and forth your job is to kill the little guy your job is to kill the big guy that's trying to kill the little guy um it made it much easier for the player to understand what was going on and much easier to teach them rather than you're on a team, go kill, just go kill things. Yeah, um, and it sounds a lot like Quidditch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but when I later, when I later worked with Valve, uh, one of the guys there said that one of the inspirations for Team Fortress was actually um, 
that they had gotten addicted to Martian football. And they went, we wanted a shooting thing where you were on a team and there were very definitive roles for each of these guys. Wow. Um, I think we knew we had a real success because uh, not too long after uh, Martian football started, we started getting noise complaints for the first time from the offices above. The battle. <laughs> <laughs> it was the first time we had groups of people yelling and screaming so loud they could be heard through six inches of concrete. <laughs> so, yeah, and the after matches worked really well for those two. People would cheer mm -hmm. oh, and scream. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Greg, right, right in this time is also um, uh, a, a development for the cockpits that you know you were one of the lead people on and that was Sightlink. So here we are in 1993, 1994 and we're connecting these sites and player groups from across the country. What was that like to be able to push that you know the Sightlink solution through? That was that was a pretty crazy thing. I mean we were using what they called ISDN and uh, I, I've heard the uh, Phone company people said that that stands for innovations subscribers don't need. <laughs> um, but it was one of the only high speed connections you could get at the time over basically worldwide. And uh, it went a whopping 128 K bits per second. <laughs> and it was quite a challenge to squeeze everything down to fit on that tiny little pipe. But eventually it worked and it was it was really generating a lot of camaraderie between sites that hadn't been there originally because it was like having tournaments between say here and Japan and uh, Las Vegas and California, all kinds of different places. It really worked out well for us, I think. Um, and yeah, uh, it, was, it, was like, it was way ahead, no question about it. Uh, well, one yeah. of the things that actually prepared us for that was our ArcNet was in a sense so bad yeah. that we we had built up incredible latencies just inside the eight things that were linked together that should have never we we'd have second and a half latencies sometimes and yeah. so we learned how to actually make the thing work so when isdn was on sometimes frankly i thought it was faster so <laughs> yep yep and then I, we also had a, a one of the great things that happened during that was uh when we started rolling this out uh, we had one of the sites in Japan, I don't recall which one it was, they, I was working late one night and they called me up and said, we can't get the system to work, uh, can you help us out? And we actually had like some remote control stuff built into the system. Uh, so I like walked into uh, one of our pod bay machines and connected to the, the site in Japan and literally brought the entire site up from, from dark. And I started hearing this guy like panicking, he was like, What's going on? All the machines here just turned on. <laughs> it was like he was acting like he thought ghosts had invaded his site, you know, because he didn't really know that I was controlling it all the way from Chicago. Well, I, I think that, that was thing, one of the things that we were always doing in site service is that <clears throat> that was one of the first times we we were doing a support model of a lot of remote support, and it was pretty amazing and. There was a, a whole lot of remote troubleshooting that was done back there. And to the techni uh, technicians that were helping support that, that skill in remote troubleshooting was invaluable. And it was just the entire reason of using that ISVN was such a innovative technology at that time, since nobody used it. I just used to remember we'd always have to spend days and days working with the telcos to actually uh, provision it correctly. Yeah, I remember at the time we were constantly worried that the telcos would decide it wasn't worth having this service anymore and discontinue it because <laughs> no one else was buying it. I think one of the things that to me that was really interesting, as much as the innovations and they were enormous and continuous on the hardware and the software, um, so much of the really, I think, long-term learnings were on the social dynamics. Um, and we've talked about a number of them uh, uh, you know, already, but, but when we introduced um, the, that long haul networking, the site link, um, one of the things that, that at least to me, that was most striking is that we, I, we, we quickly realized that if you were playing strangers on the other side of the world, they, it was like an AI. There was, that didn't mean, it, it, it didn't have the kind of social or emotional connection that it had to live players who were with you that we needed to, you know, that's why we, we ended up kind of phasing out the kind of casual play, long distance casual play, because it really wasn't adding value. Um, people weren't getting excited about it, right? They, were, they would rather play with a person, that, with someone they could identify as a human. 
and we shifted to that using it for tournament and league play where we could spend time building up who the competition was so that when you met them, there was again, a personality associated with who you were engaged with. Yeah. Um, I think operationally, you know, in the sites, setting up the site link missions was a challenge. You know, there are drops, the time differences. It was, it was quite a going on, you know, and as a site manager, it was tough. But one of the things with the community as a whole, particularly like between San Diego, Pasadena, later Costa Mesa, Las Vegas, the players were going back and forth between the sites in person to play each other. And they knew each other. And then same with people coming in from Chicago, coming in from Dallas. People knew each other. And this was a chance to reconnect again via SiteLink. They had that personal connection. And it was further reinforced, you know, by being able to not have to travel to the site. But these are people, hey, this is Rooster. We're playing with Rooster again. And they knew each other. And that just strengthened it even more or and the people wanted to do it and they knew going in there were probably going to be technical issues that were going to delay the games but they still wanted to do it and they really did enjoy it and that i think that's oh, one of the strengths of the community as a whole mm -hmm. so there's one social innovation that that i remember for red, red planet i think greg was asking for the horn i think uh, yeah. there was like buttons mm -hmm. uh, and we uh, wanted a horn i'm like why do we need okay <laughs> i i was like fine greg i'll give you the horn whatever <laughs> And yeah, that, that horn was, awesome. <laughs> was yeah, like, yeah. it was like Morse code. It was taunting. It was celebration. Mm -hmm. It was amazingly important for the social aspect oh, of the yeah. game. Absolutely. You were right, Greg. <laughs> yeah, I remember we, we, I was actually just thinking about that as sort of a social thing because it added interaction. It did. And I remember we, we, we were, when we were talking about it, it was like, no, Jordan and Ross will never go for this. So let's just put it in. <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, we started a game. There was a lot of that. With, uh, I think, with with uh, Jordan and Ross and a couple other people that like maybe Tim Disney the, the the next day and we didn't tell anybody about it yeah and we were all <laughs> flying around honking our horns at them and they came out of the cockpits and like did you hear some like horn honking going on what was that you know it's like how do you do that and for the longest time we wouldn't tell her where the button was <laughs> you know. Another thing I think that was really useful for a social standpoint that we didn't know when it got put in um, that really helped Red Planet was score compression. Because it meant that when you went in for your first couple of times, we, we, we didn't tell them it was on. We didn't tell them it was being used, but everybody was close. They got out of the cockpits and they were like, oh my God, did you see I almost beat you when they're looking at the score sheets? And that was hugely important for getting mm -hmm. people excited mm -hmm. initially. And, and Which, we and we stole that from racing games, right? The rubber banding mm -hmm. was a classic. But dynamic. we rubber banded the score, not the vehicles, and that was exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well, we, we couldn't. Well, yeah, we couldn't do the vehicles like they could. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it can be argued, you know, at, at some points that you know, in 1994, 1995, especially with the World Cup and uh, the virtual World Cup in Las Vegas, is becomes like one of you know the high points of you know cockpits and what's happening with the social dynamic. Um, what did I remember very specifically at, at that World Cup in Vegas, sitting on the O deck with this very large group of international players, you know, people from the U.S., people from Japan, and watching, you know, live cam footage of what's going on in the uh, in the pod bay. And I looked over, and Jordan, you were in the middle of this group of players, and you had this smile on your face as you were watching this interactivity and this event going on. Do you do you remember what that was like to be in the middle of that event? Oh yeah, no, that, that was really special. Um, uh, and, you know, and again, in terms of thinking about where the world has gone, I mean, that was esports before there was esports, right? I mean, international competition, you know, network or cable broadcast, you know, um, and, and just bringing together these people from all around the world who shared a passion and may not have shared one language, but they did share another language, right? Um, and and that, yeah, it was, it was super cool very emotional. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other things, one of the last things I want to touch on before we, we sh shut down for the night is I talked to uh, players and former employees from Virtual World and the Battletech Center that, that are out there. Uh, employees frequently talk about what it was like to be on site and to be part of this adventure to help people tell these interactive stories and how important it was. And for many people, how I continue to hear right now 
that that was a life changing experience for them as a center employee back in the nineties. David, what was it like to try to, you know, to build that kind of camaraderie and get employees to, to, you know, commit to this, this kind of crazy idea that was going on? I I've had, I don't know how many careers in my life and that was probably the most fun I've ever had working um, in, in any job was going around and training the site staff. Um, I remember indoctrinating them into the VGL and, you know, which was founded in 1895 by Alexander Graham Bell and Nikola Tesla for the purpose of discovering and exploring alternate dimensions. Um, Alexander Graham Bell had met Sir Richard Burton when he was younger and Sir Richard Burton had used the powers of his mind and meditation to be able to discover other worlds. And Alexander Graham Bell saw that the world was shrinking, that everything had been explored and he wanted to find other places. And then he met Nikola Tesla and the two of them together developed the VGL cockpits. I still, yeah, it's, um, I remember in San Diego with Paul, we had, a, we had an employee named Dr. Fibes. And without any prompting, in the middle of the site, when the place was crowded to the moon, and this was right after we opened, Dr. Fibes walks up to me and goes, Wicked, um, I noticed some problems with the containment wall. Do you mind if I, and he holds up an old Geiger counter that we had as a prop. <laughs> and I'm like, go for it. And he starts walking down the wall of the, con down the containment wall, taking Geiger counter readings. And there's <laughs> customers leaning against the wall and he's walking past them. And he looks at this one customer and he goes, you're fine. <laughs> and just keeps going. And this poor person standing there going, um, you know, I remember when we did the new year's party. Do you remember that Paul? Yeah when we had, the, we had the sign of how many days it had been since our last fatality. And it was on the opening manager's job to increment that sign one day. One day every day. Every morning. And in the middle of the New Year's party, we kicked everyone out of the cockpits all of a sudden and, lo and shut down all the monitors and made everyone wait for 10 minutes. And when they came back in, there was a chalk outline on the floor and the counter was at zero. <laughs> okay. Uh, that that kind of stuff the the when we, if we timed it right if we timed it when we had the regulars there it enhanced the experience so much when we did it with people who didn't know what was going on it just confused them that was the other side of that coin was people walking into the San Diego site in particular the way it was built and asking if they can get a table for four and see a menu because it was so beautiful. It was, it was so well made. It was so gorgeous. But nobody knew what we were. Um, it's another example of it's been one of the themes through this whole this whole conversation has been ahead of its time. Yeah, but okay. you know what, I remember playing a kid who came in from Germany, who mm -hmm. came in with the Make a Wish Foundation. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And you know, the, the level <laughs> of being able to experience something that the rest of the world just uh, had not yet even understood. And, and, uh, and to have that opportunity, I had people who said, you know what, I feel like I, I have a place to be where I actually have something that I am getting a glimpse to the future and I feel like I'm home. Yeah. Oh yeah, we, we had a father and son that came in every year to the Battletech Center and bought a ticket from open to close for an entire week. That was their family vacation, just the two of them. They came from Australia every year for a week. They spent a week in Chicago and they saw nothing but North Pier <laughs> because that's what they came to do. Yeah. yeah. I think also one of the things when David and I opened the San Diego Center, you know, we, we posted our flyers at comic shops, hobby stores, colleges, and, and those are the type of people were predisposed to play the game. And we had so many people coming in. We really had the chance to pick the people who fit, who are really into this type of thing. And then when you go into the site, the site itself, the theming just lent itself to it, mm -hmm. you know, so they could get into the world and they were into it. And then after hours play, when we're training them and got them to play the game and all of a sudden now they're hooked, you know, and then the lab coats, all that, it just lent itself to that. And, and most of the players or most of the, the, the site managers were players as well mm -hmm. and we were all very passionate about that and that 
I think, went down to the site employees as well. Uh, and the company was growing. And so employees had a chance to grow with the company. So Bespin, you know, Jennifer Brown started in San mm -hmm. Diego, went to Pasadena. Other people moved up. They got hired on, became crew chiefs or techs, site techs, and then would move on to other stores and do that. So I, I think that was part of the magic um, that we were all in this together. And we all got to share that with the players. Um, and that's one of the things that made working at the site so enjoyable. Sure, there were tough times. You know, the site's crashing on a Friday night, Saturday night. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You know, <laughs> things like that. It was, you know, I mean, that could be really tough. But the pluses far outweighed that, you know. And, and so it was a great chance to, for them to be a part of that. Uh, and I think they enjoyed the history aspect. And as I was talking to you yesterday, Chris, um, you know, when I was a player, um, you know, I got a chance to say, you know, I'm a, the best in the world at this. And it was a small thing. It was the Battletech Center. You know, how many people were playing? And in the overall scope of things, you know, it's a huge fish in a tiny pond. But there's not a lot of things that people can say, I'm the best in the world at something. And people at the Virtual World Centers got a chance to do that. And I think that's really, really important. And I think, right. I think that's why it sort of resonates even to this day. Okay. Like even naming, even naming courses in Red Planet, mm after the noted players, you know, where they actually got to be basically say, I was the first person to discover this new space to make this new record. And we kept that record forever throughout the operations of the yeah. centers. Indeed. Right. Indeed. And one of the things that was also uh, important about the interactions between the guests and everything else were the interactions from the staff and that we mm -hmm. had there because Almost all of us had names that all the staff knew from our call signs. Mm. They've never met us. But we had also taken off some legendary status. And it was like, oh, well, I've heard of Milo. You know? Right. And, yeah, yeah. I mean, gamer tags, to me, it was a natural thing because we all had call signs. And yep. so, you know, yep. that was before there were even gamer tags. I, I yeah. tell people I've had my gamer tags since 1990, and they look at me cross-eyed. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so I, I, this has been a, a wonderful evening, and I really appreciate everyone telling these stories. And to wind it up, I'd like to go through everybody real quick and say, "Hey, it's you know, it's 2020. Looking back, what what has this experience? What was that experience like in the 90s? What did that mean to you? And what do you take away from it today?" So, Paul, I'm going to stick with you since you're the since I'll start with you since you were so eloquent yesterday when you and I talked. I'm in Japan. I've been in Japan for 19 years and working at Virtual World is one of the impetuses that got me here. You know, I opened the first Virtual World site in Kyoto and I'd always had an interest in Japan, but that spurred it and got me here. But, you know, it was, you know, I, I think at the time, I'm not sure how many of us really realized how important and how influential the centers and Battletech Center and, uh, Battletech uh, and, and the virtual centers would be. So I think looking back, I think I wish I would have appreciated it more in terms of being able to realize more how much at the center of the gaming world we were and in a lot of ways we still are and how the, the ripples have spread out. Um, but for me, you know, it was 100%, you know, uh, 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 a life-changing experience. Obviously, I was a player. I got hired on to open a store, open another store, move down to corporate, got a chance to see the inside workings of, of the company, be a part of some of the decisions that were made. Um, so yeah, it was, it was just great. And it still influences my life. It's still part of those things. When we see the posts and the groups in, in Facebook and all these things that are coming up, it's like, yeah, I was there. Yeah, I was there. That, that, that was part of it. You know, I was part of that history. And it's when it, those moments when you think about we were part of history and seeing all the faces here together, this is gaming history. But unless we would have been here together at this time right now, how much of that has sort of faded. But now this brings it back and makes it, you know, so much more appreciable how important it was for a lot of us and particularly myself in, in my life, you know, getting to where I am now. Cool. Thank you, Paul. Thank Jose, you very much. Uh, how, how, how did that feed into you and what you do today? Well, when I started off, I had no desire to go into entertainment. And then <laughs> it's been my life's passion now. I, I've taken all the experiences that I've had in virtual world and taken it from just being an engineer to learning about the social dynamic and to learn about the enjoyment and the sensory and emotional connection that we get. And 
I've taken that in that uh, that information, and I've and in sort of a return to what you were alluding to earlier, I've come back to the mouse. I, I've been at Disney for 17 years, and I'm doing it, and I'm still trying to pound into them some of the lessons that we've learned. <laughs> <laughs> uh, David, what about you? Um, well, to mirror what Jose and Paul said, it started me on a lifelong career. I've been making my living off of video games in one form or another since I started. But the other thing I'd add to what they said is um, lifelong friendships that got made at the Battletech Center and the virtual world sites and the work that I've done there, done from there, from... Um, from JM yelling at me to whip the beasts to, uh, to you know, to at three o'clock in the, at, after 36 <laughs> hours straight working on MechWarrior 4 with Dave McCoy, both of us falling down laughing because winner. I shoved a spoon in his face um, when we were trying to get, do you remember that? When we were trying to get the first mission going, you looked oh, yeah. at me and you said, you know how you can tell when you've been working too long? And I said, no when? And you go, when the stupidest thing is funny. And I said, you mean like this? And shoved a spoon in your face. And then we went home because we just couldn't stop laughing. Um, to, we called that spoon factor. Later. Yeah. <laughs> to, Mort calling, to Mort calling me up at the Battletech Center and saying, I need you to go make the deposit right now um, and, get them, and, and get the money to the bank and all of that. I mean, it, it's the, the memories and the friendships that got made there are even more than the career the things that the things that i hold dear thank you uh jam albertson yes well I, for me it's two things one it was my band of brothers time we went through hellacious stress and we had no right to actually make what we ended up making it was you know desperation and hard work and just being so tired all the time but not stopping and learning persistence i mean and it, it turned me into kind of the principal engineer I am today. And I think I, I have done higher quality work since then where I've had more time, but I've never done an equivalent. I've never made an impact like I was able to make there. And that those days will never come again. And I, I'm so appreciative that I got to be there during that time. I mean, yes, they were probably, go, joining Microsoft would have probably been more lucrative at that time. I wouldn't trade that for all that money because I got to experience being pushed to the absolute limit of what I could do. And it's rare in life that you, that you can see that and come through out on the other side. And so that, that's what I really remember about it was from a selfish perspective, it took everything it, it was the one thing i was like i was born to be there to do the things hacky as they were that helped make it go and i loved doing it with a bunch of other people i was telling someone just the other day the thing that i loved was being asked interesting questions it's like dave mccoy one day comes in he asked me in the living room in the uh kitchen he had a an algorithm to try to auto sort uh his his uh, visibility graphs. Because back then it was all hand edited kind of assembly. And that's like, oh my God. And they said, it's impossible. I'd never thought about the problem. And he, he comes up with this thing and there's a reason he's more of an artist, let's say, than a programmer. It, it, it was, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, sorry, dude, this is not gonna work. But it was that night when I, you know, I woke up in the morning and it, it kicked something loose. And I spent like an hour and a half thinking about the saran wrappy thing. And then within a week, we had an automated system. And I remember when Dave first watched it do it, it was some helicopter shape. And he goes, well, I wouldn't do it that way. And then he stopped himself. He goes, but I'm not doing it. It's done. I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> and that moment, I would, have I would have never thought about that problem if Dave hadn't had an actual real problem that he needed solved. And he asked me that interesting question. And I treasure that. And it's an excellent uh, segue to Dave McCoy. You know, I, I, it was it was great fun to just tilt at something that people had not attempted before, where there were no, there was just no no guide to follow. You just had to basically just innovate, and uh, that was wonderful. But um, I think 
one of the things I miss uh, creating uh, artistry and gaming and other entertainment media is there was the opportunity to go and watch the impact to see the father and son that uh, that came in, you know, to uh, to watch all the people having a good time uh, and to say, you know what, uh, I made somebody's day better. And, and I and I use that combination of technology and innovation, but also story storytelling and make believe in order to, to make this wonderful alternate reality experience. So, uh, um, you know, I see a lot of gray hair on these screens here and a lot of thin hair. And uh, now that I'm in that category, I have to say, like JM said, a band of brothers, it's like to have had this experience with such wonderful people and to have done this innovative work that was on the cutting edge was a spectacular experience and uh and it's it's driven my career throughout you know the rest of my experience being in on the xbox creation and being in on other primary things to mm -hmm. get with a great group of people and push the boundary and, and then bring smile onto people smiles onto people's faces and make the world a little better place so i i still strive to do that greg corson take it away you know, I think one of the things that uh, I, I've been thinking about what I could say about this, and I think one of the things that uh, we did that was a first in probably the entire game industry uh, was that this was probably the first time any game had been developed where all the developers had regular daily contact with the people that were playing the games. And that made a huge difference in what we were doing because you know that you would put something in one night and instead of seeing people's reactions in a magazine 10 months later you would see it the next morning you know you would you would, could walk into the site and hear people going yeah that horn is cool or the mission review really is is a is an excellent thing to mess with and you know it, it's there's a lot of firsts that we did in when we were working on this project and but i think that's one of the most interesting ones it certainly was for me that you know was really the first time anybody could walk into a place where people were playing your games and see the results of what you'd done mm -hmm. you know and the it it was always you know every time somebody complained you felt like you had to fix something and every time somebody was happy you wanted to do more of it you know it was great and uh, of course it was always fun to just have the com camaraderie of all the people working and playing practical jokes on them you know that was always good fun. I I, I remember one we did to, I I did to Jordan uh, when we were working in Walnut Creek. You were talking about the days since the last accident sign, and you were bringing the uh, MTV guys through on a tour. And I don't think you knew at the time that me and several of the other techs had walkie talkies, and we were walking in front of you the whole time, making sure everything was perfectly set up for when you walked in the room. <laughs> And uh, that day we were we went into the the briefing room, and the sign said, you know, 320 days since the last fatal injury, and we said, you know what, let's mess with that, you know. <laughs> and we we walked out of the room, and Jordan walked in, and he said, you can see it's been 300, and the sign said zero. <laughs> 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 but that anyway, that that sort of thing, the, the 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 fun of just messing around, and and the fact that we could actually see the results of what we were doing the very next day was one of the best parts of the whole experience. And it's funny because I've been working at Sony now in R&D for 20 odd years, and I've already pulled up uh, our stuff as prior art for, for the legal department from people who are claiming to have invented stuff we did in the 90s, except they claim they did it in 2010. <laughs> so, you know, as we've basically saved at least three or four major lawsuits because of that, you know, the, the stuff that we did and people were just claiming that they'd already, they'd done it in 2010 and had a patent on it. And it's like, nope, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so we had an impact there as well, but it was always good fun. And that was what I loved about it. Excellent. Thank you. Mort, what, what do you take away from it? I'm different than all of you guys because I'm not a gamer. Uh, my experience has been in running businesses of one kind or another. Uh, I had two great pleasures from the experience. One was to see something come up nothing. Uh, it's not like making a board game. This, this was a, an incredibly technical piece of business 
and uh, we were skating on thin ice for four years. Uh, when I told David to get the deposit in, it's because we needed the money. <laughs> we're we're going to make payroll. The other thing is that that uh, I'm 86 now. I spent 25 years working with my son, and that was one of the great pleasures of my life. He's an incredibly uh, interesting guy, and uh, as I as I near the end of my life, it's one of the pleasures I think about all the time. So, thank you, Ross. It, you know, as as JM and Dave have said, it was uh, a lot of hard work over a really long time to create you know, uh, a cockpit, a game, an experience that, you know, every one of us growing up wanted to do. All of us wanted to sit in the cockpit, play with the joystick, fly the machine, shoot the bad guys. And, <clears throat> you know, we were able to, as Mort said, build it from scratch. And, uh, you know, working on <clears throat> the backside of it, you lose sight of how much it affected other people outside and uh you know it was fun you know a few years ago jordan and i were walking around the floor at gen con and we were able to walk around and there were the cockpits over there and there was battletech on that side shatter on stuff going over there and it's uh you know amazing sometimes to see how much we've touched we still get people saying what a life changing experience the projects we worked on were and uh and and the other thing is it's a matter of timing you know what other time in our lifetimes did all the things come together so that we were able to do it technology was just good enough to do what we wanted to do when we figured out a way to do it um the market was just ready for something like this probably not ready enough for it but <laughs> You know, it was all a matter of timing, and that's been true from from all of the things that we've done. It's just uh, getting the right team together at the right time and putting in the sweat and making it happen. Great. Okay, thank you, Ross. Jordan, close us out. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard to follow those because uh, I think they're also they're also true and and from the heart. Um, and they're uh, you know I, I think for me. As many people have said already, um, it's it's about the people. Uh, it was about the people that that came together to uh, to make this incredible experience. Um, I think it's frankly about the naivete to believe we could. Um, I think one of the greatest uh, uh, treasures a, an entrepreneur and and startup teams have is that they're dumb enough to think they can change the world. Uh, and you have to have that naivete to actually do it. Um, and I think we did. I think we we believed in ourselves. We, we believed that, you know, if you had enough hours, at, enough nights at 3 a.m., you were going to get it done. Um, uh, and I think we fed, like any kind of theatrical experience, which is what we made, you, we fed off the audience's energy, right? Um, and uh, And I think you know, it became a symbiotic relationship between us, our, our, the energy we, between ourselves and the energy going back and forth with, uh, with the players. Um, and, and, you know, the players are, look at, without them, nothing happens, right? So, you know, they're stepping up and, and involving themselves at the, at the dawn of this new uh, era of entertainment, um, you know, was, uh, was a huge deal on their part too. I mean, uh, as people said, <laughs> when David said, you know, car or battle and play more battle tech, um, that, you know, people invested heavily, and that was uh, that was critical for us. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's uh, it was an incredible experience. It was something that um, I don't think we'll see again. Um, uh, in that, as Ross said, it was a unique combination of time, of talent, of inspiration, and and naivete. Um, that uh, that I'm just very very honored uh, to have played a role in. Well, thank you, thank you, Jordan. Um, Different from almost everybody who's been participating in this. Uh, I haven't been in the, you know, interactive entertainment field for a very long time, since 1997. My daily life is working with uh, live entertainment in education. 
and frequently in my office, uh, hanging in my office walls are uh, Battletech blueprints from the virtual world centers. And people ask me, what is that? And I summarize it in a very brief sentence that it was the right people at the right place at the right time and we made magic. And I think that's the best way to actually sometimes summarize what happened at the Battletech Center and at the virtual world centers. So I wanna thank everybody for participating. It has been a wonderful night tonight and uh, I can't wait to see what the next step is for all of you incredible innovators and uh, engineers. This has been great, thank you. Well, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you, Chris. And thanks thank Ross, Jordan and Mark for bringing all the rest of us into this adventure. And Indeed. All, <laughs> all the colleagues. Dragging us into play. your quixotic uh, quest that you brought us along with. <laughs> <laughs>
Emily, this is a rescue mission, not a cavalcade of carnage. Just lock your radar on them so we can drag them back, please. 